new producer here. Yes, and she's not as good. <laughs> glad, glad to have that. But, but anyway, Thursday was Monday Thursday. That's uh, the Last Supper. And then, of course, Jesus' trials. And then the crucifixion on Friday. And we're going to study a little bit about Easter before we get into our study of Exodus again. Uh, how many got to see the Ten Commandments last night? Yeah, I mean, it made a lot more impact when you're studying the Exodus, and it was pretty biblically accurate, right? you know, except for all the commercials. It was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have a bunch. Uh, good to see Jack Bush. He sent me this. He said, do you ever wake up? and kiss the person sleeping beside you and feel glad that you are alive. I just did and apparently will not be allowed on this airline again. <laughs> but that was great. Okay, if you take your outline, turn to page three. Page three, Easter. And we'll have a little bit about the whole Holy Week, uh, I, did, I learned for the first time this week that Jewish tradition back then said that the spirit does not leave the body until three days. I did not realize that. It's one of the reasons Jesus took his time raising Lazarus. It's the, one of the reasons that he was in the tomb for three days, and I'll explain that because Jewish time is a lot different than our time, the way they uh, calculated time. It was also prophesied in Hosea that uh, the Messiah would be three days in the tomb. David prophesied that God would not allow his Holy One to suffer corruption in the tomb. He would not commit him to Sheol, Jesus prophesied it. He said, destroy this, this temple, and in three days, I'll build it back up. And so that was one of the uh, things I learned this week about it. But the way the Jews kept time, they started uh, the day at uh, sundown. And it would go to sunrise, and if you had part of a day like we calculate three days is 72 hours that's not the way they calculated it um, so his crucifixion started at uh, about nine o'clock in the morning on Good Friday and Jesus spent six agonizing hours on the cross and he died approximately 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And so that's the first day. And if you look on your outline, Luke, I took all these passages from Luke. I love reading Luke. Luke got most of his information from Jesus' mother, Mary. And when they had come to the place called Calvary where they crucified him and the criminals on the right hand and the other on the left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What love in his eyes. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was also written over him in the letters in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, the three languages uh, of the day there. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged, blasphemed him, said, if you're Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God? seeing you're under the same condemnation, and indeed justly for us, for we receive the due reward, but this man has done nothing wrong. 
Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour. That's 12 noon. And there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. So for three hours, it says, all the earth was darkened and the sun was darkened. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. Key verse, because now you don't need a high priest. You can go directly to Christ because he is our high priest. And Jesus had cried out with a loud voice. He said, to tell stuff, it's finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, where would he be in paradise with this thief? Well, according to the scriptures, Jesus descended to Abraham's bosom. That's where Old Testament saints were kept until Christ was ascended and resurrected. And then Luke 24, 1 to 9, Easter. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain of the women with them came to the tomb bringing spices, which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen, risen indeed. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee? saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told these things to the eleven, minus Judas Iscariot, and the rest. And then Luke 24, 38 to 41, Christ meets his disciples and reminds them of the scriptures. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you have doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and feet, he was bodily resurrected. I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. But while they were Still did not believe for joy and marveled. He said to them, have you any food? There's going to be food in heaven. That's encouraging. I wonder if it'll include pecan pies. <laughs> and then uh, Luke 24, 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses which we're studying now, and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, and but tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued from power on high. And that would be Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given. And then finally, Luke 24, 50 to 53. <coughs> he led them out as far as Bethany. This is the ascension. This took place 40 days after his resurrection. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven and they worshiped him 
and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. That's the Easter story. It's the greatest event in the history of humankind. It is powerful. Linda. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I read something this morning and I don't know if I ever read it or what, but it sort of bothered me. Uh, in Luke's version, it talks about the thieves on the cross. Yes. About one says he was he was very uh, uh, reverent toward Jesus. The other one, and each of the gospels were written by different people. Correct. Some of them, and they weren't there necessarily, so they got information from others. In Mark, it says both thieves. This is in Mark 15, and I read this this morning. It says, even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. And that seems sort of opposite of what... Well, like Gary Kendry used to say, the four Gospels were written by four different right. reporters about the same that. events. So, possibly, His the man had a conversion on the cross. He might have started out yep. saying some things and then realized what was happening. Yeah, it but, just sort of bothered me when I read that because it seemed the opposite of what I had always Yeah, I like, I like the reason I like Luke. Mary was right there in front of the cross. Correct. And she heard what Jesus said directly to her so she could hear the conversation. Yeah, uh -huh. And uh, Jesus said to the Apostle John, behold your mother. You're going right. to take care of her the rest of her life. Mother, behold your son. So she was right there. I like, that's one of the reasons I like Luke. But it, it doesn't um, it I doesn't guess I change just the never event. Had read Mark's version, maybe. I'd always come to Luke. It's uh, it's good to read all of them. Yeah. Because they're slightly different perspectives about the same event, and it's one of the reasons I know the gospel is true. They didn't all get together and come out with the same story. So that's important. Well, back to your outline, we'll get started in Exodus. We're going to do chapters 19 and 20. And uh, what we learned last week, Jesus is our blessed rock and redeemer. He'll give you the water of life, the precious Holy Spirit. Joshua becomes Moses' general. During the 40-year trip to the promised land, he is brave, fearless, and a godly man. And then three, when facing adversity, prayerfully seek wise counsel from a spiritually mature believer. Moses received helpful wisdom from his father-in-law, Jethro. So open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. And as you remember where we are, God continues to bless the children of Israel in their journey with food and water. Even when they doubt him, Moses chooses Joshua, have their first battle with the Amalekites, and Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brings Moses' wife, Zipporah, and his two sons to visit and hear of the miracles and give good advice. So in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, so they left about beginning of April. So you're talking about April, May, June. We're probably heading into the summer here. And then the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and they come to the desert of Sinai. And he had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel encamped before the Mount of God. God said he would bring them to worship him at this mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. That verse is very reminiscent of Revelation that we studied not long ago, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 14. 
And it says to the woman, which is Israel, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a time, and half a time, three and a half years from the face of the serpent. So God uses that description fairly regularly. Verse five, now, therefore, if, and I circled if, if you will obey my voice and thee and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people of the earth. For the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. I believe that God wants all his followers to be a royal priesthood to be ministers of the gospel wherever you are. That was the dream he had for Israel. But he said, if, and at the big if, because they didn't. Verse seven, and Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. You know, they're all enthusiastic now. And Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. He is going to reinforce Moses' apostleship because he's going to let the people hear him speak directly to <clears throat> Moses. And Moses told the words to the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Get them all cleaned up and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And you'll set bounds to the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourself that you don't get too close to this mountain or touch the border, for whoever touches the mountain will be put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he'll surely be stoned or shot, whether it be beast or man, and it shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mountain. What does that sound like? That sounds like the rapture yeah. trumpet. And Moses went down the mount of the people and sanctified them, get them to clean up, get ready, be prepared mentally, 100% attention. And he said to the people, be ready against the third day and come not at your wives. No sex. This is training camp. Stay away from your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there was thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the people in the camp trembled. I'll bet. Just think about what they're seeing. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the lower part of the mountain and Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Now this mountain's about 7,000 feet. If it's the one that uh, is in the Sinai Peninsula, they're not a thousand percent sure that it's the same one, but most commentaries said it is. So Moses said 80 years old, pretty good shape. 
He's running up and down this mountain several, several times. And uh, he said to Moses, go down and charge the people. Tell them not to break through. Don't try and get too close. And let the priests also know, don't come too close, lest the Lord break forth on them. And Moses said to the Lord, well, they really can't come up with set boundaries like you said. And the Lord said to him, get out and reinforce it. These people will perish and you shall come back with Aaron, but let not the priests and the people break through. And so Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. So this is a great event that's going to happen here. The next chapter is God is going to, for the first time, introduce the Ten Commandments, the law. So chapter 20, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he's identifying himself. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make to you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or it's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me. Now that's an interesting story because if you look at family lineage, if you've got atheist parents who hate God, typically the kids are gonna be like that too. And it's passed on from generation to generation. Just like faith in Christ, your faith can be passed on to your children and grandchildren and so on. So good begats good. Verse six, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. When I hear someone cuss, the Lord's name, it's like fingernails on a blackboard to me. So I can imagine what it's like to the creator of the universe. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He just instituted the Sabbath day at Passover. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God in it you shall not do any work, nor your son, nor your daughter, your maidservant, your manservant, nor your cattle. The cattle have to rest too, nor your strangers that are within your gates. <clears throat> For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and then rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Doesn't say whether they were good parents or not. You're to honor your father and your mother. 13, you shall not kill. Now this is translated murder. You shall not murder. You may have to fight battles in war that's not what this is talking about. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor your neighbor's wife, <coughs> nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox or donkeys or anything that is your neighbor. And all the people saw the thunderings and lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And the people saw it and they backed up. 
this must have been terrifying <laughs> to see. <clears throat> and then they said to Moses, listen, you talk to us. You talk to us. But don't let God talk to us anymore. It's going to kill us. It must have been so powerful. And Moses said to the people, fear not. For God has come to test you, and that his fear may be for your faces, and that you sin not. These Ten Commandments should be posted in every school, every business, every courthouse. People have no fear of the Lord these days. They have no one to account to. They've been taught evolution. And so... <clears throat> this is why he came and the people and the Lord said to Moses thus shall say to the children of Israel it seems that I've talked with you from heaven God talked directly this is the verbal Ten Commandments now he's going to put this in writing too uh, as you saw last night if you watched the movie you shall not make me gods of silver Neither shall you make me gods of gold. He doesn't want any idols. He wants your love, your respect, your reverence. An altar of earth you shall make to me and shall sacrifice thereon your burned offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in all places where I record my name. I will come to you and bless you and if you make me an altar of stone, you'll not build it out of cut stone. For if you lift up a tool upon it, you've polluted it. God wants it natural like he made it. He doesn't want anything artificial. Neither shall you go up. This one's kind of humorous, actually. Neither shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness be not discovered underneath. Now, apparently in those days, they didn't wear underwear. So that was the point that was being made. You got a tunic and you're walking upstairs. Uh, it can it can not put on a show. So those are our two chapters today. We'll open it up for questions or comments. Chris? <clears throat> Some of this sounds like Easter to me. Uh, before Jesus. For three days and, and just the way kind of things go and I don't know, I see some some parallels with Easter. It's the entire Bible is pointing to Easter. Everything that happens from creation to the patriarchs, to the resurrection of the Hebrew people from slavery, it's all pointing to Christ. Frank, anything you want to add over there? I'm going to do that every week just so you know. <laughs> I should come prepared. Oh, brother. Uh, the, about the best thing I can say is the best thing in the world we can do is go back and relive the story and try to do our best to imagine ourselves being there. If you were one of those two million plus people at the foot of Mount Sinai and you're seeing this event and you're hearing God speak directly it must have been the most Powerful, impressionable thing. Now, if all of us were there, yeah, we would all have a different story to tell. Yeah, I, we would see it from our own perspective. Some of some of us would probably have <laughs> passed out, <laughs> fainted <laughs> from this. Yeah. And you know, it, it always cracks me up when I uh, I say I know I like to watch the History Channel, but when they have that ancient aliens were the ones that did this. 
Well, if they were ancient aliens doing this, they were pretty darn holy. When you look at what they're telling the Hebrew people, this is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the creator of the universe, speaking directly to these people. And the reason he chose them was not because they were the biggest people. They're actually the smallest race, the Jewish race. But he wanted them to be a blessing to the entire planet. He wanted them to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And if they had stuck to his ordinances and commandments, they would have. But now it includes the church. The church should be his royal priesthood on earth today. We should all be equipped to tell the story that Frank's talking about, the gospel story, and be unafraid to do it. David. And Tom, uh, is this the only example of, of God speaking directly to his people? In, in groups, in mass. I mean, yes. directly, not via prayer. Or... Yeah, he, he spoke directly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but was this the last time he spoke directly to the people, or did he do it in the future? Uh, this experience. He speak spoke through the the scriptures. I, I yeah, I sound, but this yeah. was a, they were called to the mountain. They this were all is, there. This is the beginning of our Bible. And, and what's instead happening. of Moses doing the speaking or Aaron, he took over and did it himself. Yes. I um, still recall that kind of thing happening after that event. After uh, the Pentateuch was was written, I mean, he, he spoke for 40 years to the Hebrew people. It wasn't just this one time. But after the, the scriptures were written, then it was turned over to the priests. And the tabernacle was built, and then, of course, the temple. Uh, but I don't recall any further group audiences like this. This, this was uh, pretty much it. Pretty neat one-time experience. Yeah, well, it happens again a little further along because he's going to put these commandments in writing and he's going to come out with all the ordinances on how to treat people, how to live correctly. Okay. Yes, yesterday, a friend told me that in the 40 years, Nobody's sandals ever wore out. That's true. That's right out of the Bible. Well, I didn't remember reading it in the Bible. And it said Moses, uh, his stamina. I mean, this guy was 80. So now, after 40 years, he's 120. His stamina never decreased. And their clothes never wore out. Yeah. Yeah, that's right out of the Bible. So I'm confused, logically speaking, or historically speaking, God is giving the Ten Commandments. Is it just starting at the beginning of the 40 years of desert? Wandering? Three months. They have been wandering for three months now. Three months. Okay. So uh, they left Egypt every three days. They complained about God or Moses. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now they have this amazing experience of meeting the power of God. Then what happened for another 40 days? They still complain and forget about God. Even worse. Mm -hmm. Even worse. Well, wait till Moses has to chastise and throw the Ten Commandments at them because they created uh, a golden idol. So it's just now. I mean, they, they, they need God. It, they relapse over and over and over and over. But in two cycles. It's like a you know, a drug addict with sin, you know, it just keeps coming up and out as soon as there's any kind of challenge. Hey. Well, don't you think that what that's really demonstrating is, is that there is a need for a savior and internal relationship with God because they could not live up to the Ten Commandments correct. apart from God living in them to do of his good pleasure. 
And that's the point. People still think today that they can actually, by their own strength, accomplish that. But so, they can't. It's against it's our nature, without our new nature, it's which impossible. is Jesus. You know? And I also think it's really interesting, too, because in the Old Testament, when they have this confrontation with God or this experience with God, it's all you know, powerful and awesome. And then Jesus comes in the New Testament, and he's gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and his message is, is the opposite. And yes, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, so the idea is, yes, God is not to be messed with. He is all-powerful. He is the creator of the universe. But yet he is all love. He is both. And that must have been kind of a cognitive dissonance for it's, them to be able to try to put those two things together. probably why a lot of the uh, Old Testament Pharisees didn't, think that Jesus was the Messiah because right. he didn't come with flaming chariots and you know kick the Romans out of Israel <laughs> it didn't happen that way well how do you shake off 400 years of slavery in three months after you know they've seen the Egyptians you know worship idols all their lives and they've, they've been told what to do they've been whipped they've been beaten they've, been, they've had no autonomy no structure to their society, perhaps. Yeah. You know, so. Well, it's, the slavery is like communism. You know, when you're told what you can do, you're told how to do it, you're told when you can do it, and then all of a sudden you're free. It's like the sin nature can bubble up. So, yeah, I mean, it's a period of adjustment. I think that's why God wanted them to spend this four years it gave Moses time to write the five books. It also gave them time to kind of get that out of their systems, too. Well, here's what I put down that we, what we learned today. Uh, number one, Easter is the most important event in human history and the blessed hope of all believers. We serve a risen Savior. We serve the living God. It's the only religion in the world where the Savior has risen from the dead, the empty tomb. It's the key to Christianity. God, too, God desires that his people who call him Lord serve as a royal priesthood. We're all Followers serve as ministers of the gospel. Let your light shine before men. Be salt and light. And then three, the Ten Commandments were given by God to define his holiness and instruct mankind how to live and treat each other. We now have the law. It defines sin. It defines how to live. And so it's the beginning of our faith. Christ is the fulfillment, but it's the beginning. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for the Easter story, the empty tomb, Lord Jesus, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the God of all gods raised you from the dead. And it gives us all that blessed hope that if we put our faith and trust in you and we love and reverence God and do our best to be servants of the Most High, that we'll be able to spend a paradise with you for all eternity. It is the greatest gift, the greatest story ever told. Lord, I thank you for every person here today. And those watching on YouTube, I pray that you would touch their hearts, that you would bless them, bless them and their families, and their businesses. Keep this awful virus away from them. And I ask that you be faithful and bring us back here next week where we'll continue to study your word. And we give you all the glory, all the praise in Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 We'll see you next week. Thank you.